And good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Dice Tower Winter Spectacular, which starts off with Board Game Breakfast Live here. Today is December 14th. I can remember that since it's the day after my wife's birthday. Um, thank you, Danielle. Says good luck on your Winter Spectacular. We're glad you're here with us today, folks. Now, I know that it's just me here briefly. I'm just introducing it, but we're going to get started here in just a bit. But before we do so, let me talk a little bit about what's going to be happening and what's going on. So I have a list of different things I want to go over. First of all, um, we have different t-shirts that we have for the Dice Tower Winter Spectacular. And you can find those at Geeky Goodies. And we'll have links to those in the descriptions. And you can find those if you want to get your own Winter Spectacular t-shirt. Um, also, finally, our Kickstarter is shipping. Now, if you backed our Kickstarter and you got some rewards... You probably don't have them yet, unless you live in Florida. Um, but they are out and going out. Realize that it's going to take weeks for all this to get out there for people overseas. It may take a while to get them to you, especially since this unfortunately coincided with the Christmas season. But um, either way, I'm so glad that's out there. And on that note, I have some shout outs I want to do to some of our Kickstarter backers that we really do appreciate each and every one of you. We want to say thank you to Corey Chu. We want to say thank you to Pell from Uppsala. We want to say thank you to Juraj and Mira and Game Toppers, who wants to make sure we give a shout out to all first responders out there. We want to say thank you to everybody who's also watching. You got up early. Well, some of you, it's the middle of the night. And I'm glad you're here. Um, so what else is going on? So this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're doing the Winter Spectacular. It's going to be broken up into different blocks. Like, for example, block one here is Board Game Breakfast. When we're done with this, we'll go to another block where you'll see uh, the top ten with two of my daughters, Ruby and Violet, for their games over the course of the year. But then we'll be playing some games. And as the, as the time goes by, these different blocks will happen. Interspersed throughout all these blocks are top tens all over the place. Top ten expansions, top ten components. I hope you enjoy this, but if you miss any of these small top 10 lists that I've done, we're also going to be releasing those next week by themselves so that for ease of use and finding them. Um, we have Brian Drake showing up later today. He'll be our special guest here, and I've asked that maybe he does a trick or two. We'll see. Uh, but he'll be here today and tomorrow. And, of course, we'll be going to our remote cam with Z and Amanda playing games. We'll be playing games here in the studio. And we got top ten lists from people all over the world, um, from Australia to the USA. Uh, let's see. What else we got? Contest. There's going to be different contests in the different segments. In fact, our very next one with the top ten of my daughters, there will be a contest in that segment. So stay tuned. We'll be announcing each contest as they go by. If you want to find out if you've won a contest, you can check out our website, Dicetower.com backslash contests so you'll be able to find out the information there let's see here what else we got next week so starting friday of this week we're going to be taking a bit of a break here at dice tower we put many 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 hours into breakfast here and, and into the winter spectacular so we need to take a few days off we're not actually taking some days off we're cleaning the studio and preparing Next week is Christmas week, so I've given the guys the week off, but you'll see me here with Breakfast Live next week. You'll also see uh, marble races. We're doing our winter marble race spectacular or whatever, just for fun. So we'll do that a few days over the course of next week. And um, then after Christmas is over, we're back full blast with more videos. I have so many reviews to talk about. Speaking of that, this week we did not do... Uh, we can review because we reviewed slightly fewer games last week, so we're doing it now. Um, uh, well, I'm going to tell you my games from last week, and then uh, I'm going to go into other people's week in review. We got some contributors. Then I'm going to come back with some guests, and so we're going to talk about the year 2020 overall. So for me, last week I just talked about two things, Twilight Imperium, the new expansion for that, which I thought was very good. It's a lot of stuff. It adds to the time. I'd give it an 8 out of 10. Uh, but if you wanted more stuff for Twilight Imperium, you got it. I especially like the exploration parts. And Dwellings of Eldervale, which I gave a 9 out of 10. An amazing production, fantastic game with combat and area control. It seems like it shouldn't work when you look at it, but it works together really well. Okay, so with that being said, I think I've gone through everything that I'm supposed to mention here. Oh, I, one last thing before we get started here. Want to do a nice shout out 
We have many sponsors of the Winter Spectacular. We're going to be playing some of their games. So I want to say thank you to The Op, to Asmodee, to Ravensburger, to Awaken Realms, to Arvis, to Pandasaurus, and to Board and Dice. And I hope you consider and look at their games as we play through those. And also, um, just all the different things that are going on. I hope you all enjoy that. So, I did give you my Week in Review. We're going to jump to everybody else's Week in Review. And then I'll be back, and we'll talk about the year 2020. Hey, hey, everybody, I'm Z Garcia, and here's what I reviewed last week. So I reviewed Chachapoya, which I rated 6 out of 10. This is a bidding and bluffing card game, which uh, has a, a neat sort of uh, central loop at the core of it, this idea of sort of pushing your luck, collecting sets, but if you get too many of one card, if you win too many of one thing, you are going to just be eliminated from the game. But the game has a lot of little rules, it's a little iffy, it's a little confusing, slightly more convoluted perhaps than it needs to be for a game that takes 25 minutes, so it doesn't quite bring the full package. I reviewed a Sagrada expansion called Life, which I rated 7 out of 10, and this is a good one. It's got mainly two modules, they bo both work really well, they both work well together uh, also. And I just enjoy it. I think it breathed a lot of new life into the original game of Sagrada. I reviewed Merv, which I rate a 7.5 out of 10. And I think this is a very good Euro game. It's got a lot going on in it. Uh, I think the cadence is a little strange, perhaps. you uh, Your first turn is going to be really, really short. The last one's really, really long. But overall, this is a game all about optimizing what you want to be doing, doing that, and there are a couple of really neat mechanisms at the core of it. So I like it. I recommend it if you like this kind of game. And then lastly, I reviewed together with the fellows uh, Dwellings of Eldervale, which I rate an 8 out of 10. And that's, that's a low score, by the way, uh, among all of us. And I, I, I really liked it. I think it's a, it's a strong hybrid style game some worker placement but some combat lots going on in it this is one that's going to appeal to a lot of people i think it's it's got that quality and a fantastic production as well and that's it for me i'll see you on the next one yo my peoples what's up this is jason coming at you from the beach once again here in new haven connecticut you're gonna have to rip me away from this thing <laughs> or snow me away, which is what's going to happen in about a couple of weeks. Uh, on the Dice Tower, I reviewed two games this week, the first one of which was Tranquility. Uh, this is a 1-5 to five player cooperative card game, uh, a little bit of a tile laying, uh, putting um, cards in sequential order, uh, limited information, I think that's where the game shines, it wasn't too much... Uh, as much of a fan of the solo, but I think the limited information is, is a decent. And then uh, the gamer cars that come with it, if you want to step up the experience, take the experience from decent to pretty good, 7 out of 10. Next game that I reviewed was Super Skill Pinball 4K. Uh, gave that one an 8 out of 10. It's a, a game for a healthy mind to put it in that series. Please go ahead and check out the video. Uh, I think I give a little bit of a unique take on why I love this game so much. So uh, this is Jason reminding you um, to enjoy your games. And enjoy the day. So this week for Four Squares, we did two different videos. The first one was a first impressions of the Prophecy Kings expansion for Twilight Imperiums, one of my favorite games of all time, so make sure to check that out. Lots of interesting thoughts there. And then we also did Dwellings of Eldervale, a full review of this with the crew, and it was super awesome. Um, I really enjoyed this game. This is a nine for me. This is definitely one of my favorite games so far, so i um, definitely super excited about it. So check out both of those videos. Hi everybody, I'm Michael from the Nerd Shelves, and this week Judy and I reviewed Trekking the World, a beautiful game with a giant map you put on the table and you travel the map, taking tours, going on journeys, collecting souvenirs. It's a beautiful game, on the lighter side, but we had a lot of fun and we rated that a 7 out of 10. We also reviewed Similo. Similo is a party game for 
two to as many players as you can fit around the table, where one player gives clues to try to get the other players to guess who the secret character is. Uh, there's a fables theme and a history theme and a myths theme, and you can play with all the themes together. It's beautiful to look at, super fun, plays in about 10 or 15 minutes. I highly recommend it, and we rate Similo a 7 out of 10. That's it for this week. Take care. Hey there everybody, it's Mike Delicio, and this week I did two videos. The first was a first impressions video for the new expansion for Twilight Imperium 4. I had never played any version of Twilight Imperium before I played this game, so if you want to hear my thoughts on that, as well as the thoughts of Tom uh, Roy and Stephen Bonacore, check that video out. And then I also did a Four Squares review with Tom, Z, and Roy for Dwellings of Eldervale. And I rated that a 10 out of 10. Fantastic, fantastic game. Hybrid style game, which tend to be in my wheelhouse anyway. Uh, this game has pretty much everything I look for. It has tight Euro mechanics. It has quite a bit of player interaction, but never in a way that feels mean or targeted. I really, really think this game is fantastic. Well, that's it for me this week. Let's keep this winter spectacular moving. Names, all court names do it in our case. What's your failure or interesting stories about it, Tarrant? I think for me, I can always go back to. I'm, I'm quite poor at um, really taking in all the information when, no, we, I am. when this, we play duet. This is why we always fail, or almost always fail. Yeah, we don't have a great strike. No. Um, I think the one that always strikes me the most is I, it was the first clue of the game. Um, I was trying to link as many together as I could. I saw this really tenuous link. I can't remember what all the words were, but my clue was scythe because there were there were a few things there that related to scythe. Like there was the the food resource. Yeah, um, yeah, like I the, think yeah. The corn or something or whatever it was. So there were a few uh, elements to the scythe game as well as I think a uh, gardening tool thing. And this all seemed good. I thought it was a a, a risky clue, but thought it would be okay. Um, I had failed to notice that one of the assassin words was game, <laughs> and so that uh, ended <laughs> things. <laughs> that ended thing abruptly. Very swiftly. Did I pick that first? Um, I can't remember if I picked that first. It went because, pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, it was like the first or the second one, <laughs> and I can't remember. Like I've got other mistakes as well. Uh, it's so hard to link things together, and then trying to also see which one is the assassin or the one that you know, or just like. Was that pedestrian? The, um, the witness? Yeah, bystander. Bystander, sorry, yes. So that's our story. What's yours? Run in the comment section. And we are Meepo University on YouTube and also on the Dice Tower for many videos. See you next time. Hey there Dice Tower fans and I hope your breakfast is going fantastic. I'm Dave here with Gamevine and welcome to the very first Expand It Yourself. Now the first game we're going to focus on is doing a self-expansion of Hearts of Attraction. Now this is a fantastic game of magnets and attraction. What you're basically trying to do is take these little heart magnets, throw them at other ones that are set up on the table to make clusters and try to get the biggest clusters to have the most hearts at the end of the game. Pretty straightforward and simple game. So because it's such a simple game, I knew it wouldn't be getting any kind of expansion, so I thought I'd take it upon myself to do just that. But let's go down to the table and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I am hard pressed for some space, so I have a tiny little table right here with a few of the hearts. Now, in the main game of Heart of Attraction, you would take one of these hearts and just slide it on the board, and if you get a cluster, you would collect it. And if uh, a heart cluster were to fall off and you catch it, well, you get, get that whether it's on your turn or not. Now, I wanted to make this a little bit more lively and like I said, I come across these magnets all the time at the, at the flea market, and I call these mines. So instead of giving you a point, these will be negative one points. And this really does cut the score in half and makes it a little more tactile. Now, the other rule that I kind of implemented is if you were to catch a mind, you wouldn't get negative points. Instead, you'd get to steal one of the other player's hearts. A little bit of take that in the game if you want. 
So that was the first Expand It Yourself. Let me know what you think about this segment down in the comments below and see if we can do more in the future. But until next time, I'm Dave here with the Game Find. Join me at my channel sometime. But until next time, have a great rest of your breakfast. I'm out. Bye. Hey everyone, how you doing? It's Clara and I'm back talking about what it is I'm looking out for when I'm watching board game reviews, what I'm looking out for and what I want from my games. And it's probably no surprise that I love RPGs, fantasy RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. I play Dungeons and Dragons and I've even got critical role posters behind me. Uh, behind the Christmas tree. So I love that aspect. And if a board game can really incorporate role playing into it, I love it. And my favorite games that do that are Legends of Andor. They're so much fun. Um, they manage to, they've built a world and they manage to drip out the story and each one continues between games and between, you know, full collections. It's just really nice. And, and with it, you're not just going out to kill things. In fact, sometimes it's not advantageous if you're trying to find potions you're better spending your time searching for things than trying to kill things. I really enjoy that. Um, and it's true with other games as well. Amazingly, uh, the adventure games. I mean, there's not much in this small little game, but somehow me and my friend managed to take that story and turn it into a big old role-playing adventure, and it's actually really good fun. And let's not get into mice and mystics. Those mice have got love triangles and all sorts. But sometimes... <sighs> games don't quite do it you think they would so these um books i've got all the the dritz books and the legends of dritz have a board game based on books that i've read and yet somehow even though i already knew the story the r play the role playing didn't quite come across i didn't quite enjoy it and in fact it just felt like going to the dungeon kill the bad guys and that's a shame for an ip that and i i absolutely love um, the role playing didn't come through, and again, it's Wizards of the Coast. You'd sort of expect it would, so it's curious that it didn't. And I'm wondering what games you enjoy that really bring out the RP, and which ones, to be honest, kind of miss it. Till next time, bye. Scarlet nose. Carrot nose. Yes. Yes. Here in America, we recently celebrated our Thanksgiving holiday, uh, which is why I wanted to take a look at a small roll and write game called Harvest Dice. So the first player is going to roll all the dice and then choose one to either plant that particular vegetable in their garden or feed the pig. If you decide to plant a vegetable in the garden, you will draw that type of vegetable in the column that the dice show if you decide to feed the pig, you simply cross off the same number of pips from the die onto the score sheet in one row. This will continue until there's only one die left in the center of the table. All of the players will then cross off one of the circles in their baskets that match that color die that's left. So five reasons why I like this game Harvest Dice. Reason number one, it's a twofer. It checks off two boxes that my wife and I really enjoy when it comes to games. It's a roll and write game and it's about food. Second reason is you can draw pictures in this game. You're not just making X's or writing numbers, which means you can use colored pencils. Yes, I know you can use colored pencils for any roll and write game, but in this game, you're drawing vegetables. So when you're finished with the game, your score pad looks pretty cool with those carrots, tomatoes, lettuce, all nice and bright. Next reason is this is a roll and write that does not give you any negative points for any reason at the end of the game, for any empty spaces or things like that. Reason number four, the scoring in this game varies greatly. There's a lot of different ways to get points. There's a lot of different bonuses that are awarded. There's a varying market value to the vegetables, so your scores are never going to be the same uh, from game to game, which makes your strategy change a little bit as well. Reason number five, there are no dead turns in this game. You're never looking at the dice thinking, oh, I can't do anything. You can always feed the pig, which is going to get you points anyway, or give you the ability to alter dice. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care, and don't forget to feed the pig. Feed the pig! Alrighty, folks. I just realized that I need to... I'm going to be adding people in here, but for some reason... My computer's not allowing it. I can tell you why, because one of the people I'm adding probably has some 
some just it's illegal some of the stuff that they're doing all right hang on one second Roy's, Roy's going to be like, man, I told you. All right, folks, here we go. So I'm going to be adding some folks in, hopefully. Frozen. Oh, no, but on, on the live, he's not. Oh, he's good. All righty, folks, so I'm going to add in various people here. First of all, we have Mr. Z Garcia will be joining us this morning. And Am I live? we I have Hi. Hi. We have Mike Delicio. Hello. Hello everybody. I'm going to assume that I'm live. Hello. Good morning. Now for some reason, Roy, it's showing me your desk, the table, and not you. Disgusting. Ooh. That's what? That's strange. Also, it's Tim, it's not showing that. you either. <laughs> Folks, can you hear Roy and Tim? I can hear Both of your cameras. Woo. Both. <laughs> All right. Well, I got two people. Well, okay. Well, while we're waiting for uh, Tim and Roy to get in here, we will sadly add Mr. Bonacore. Oh. So, hey. Winter spectacular. Real cold. Wow. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> That's. That's some dedication to a bit, Stephen. That's yeah. impressive. Hi. <laughs> Nonsense. Damn. I'm in Florida. Winter. Oh. You think really it's a wise idea to mock everyone that actually is cold? <laughs> at the mocking moment? everybody. It's cold in some places, and I'm commiserating. And then you're taking that off because you can and saying, ah, I'm in Florida. I'm sweating. Deal with it, you bunch of cold jerks. That's what you're doing, Bonacore. No, I don't. You're a hey, Tim, can you talk real briefly? Yes, I can. Am I there? I went to my uh, laptop. Now I go to a regular... Am I here or not? Nobody can hear me? See me? I hear you. Well, I think we can hear you. Z, your camera only shows up when you talk, which is amazingly cool. I wish that worked with Bonacore, and then I would mute him. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go out and come back in? Yeah, let's try that, Tim. Let's see what happens here. I don't know what the deal is, folks. Sorry I about think that. You have his set on active speaker. There's an active speaker setting, and you probably have Z instead of selected on his name. You have it on active speaker. That's right, baby. Yeah. Active. Stay That's active, active kids. Speaker. Folks, this is 2020. And <laughs> everything, everything can go wrong and will every time. Yeah, this is the opening ceremonies of the Winter Spectacular. Look, we're 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 working everything out right now, and we are going to have it just stunning. By problem, <laughs> problem number one, making Tom run the. Hey, uh, Tim's back visual. now. That's problem. And now Bonacore's doing the same thing that that Z did, where he only comes on when he talks, which is amazing. Mm. All right, folks. Well, we are just going to have to oh. live with Z coming in and out. <laughs> Z, are you still there? Mm. I am definitely still here, and I would say that this show is very <laughs> apropos to 2020 as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just all right, remember, so, Z, I normally run these things. <laughs> the all right. The problem, Z, is you just talk the entire time, and that way okay, you I can do that. I'll just make sure <laughs> just I'm always saying murmur. something just a little under my breath. I, like anyway, right. I, want, just, huh. I want my face on. <laughs> Garbage year 2020. It's been rough out here for everybody. 2020. I'll just All do right. that, and I'm always on the screen. There you go. Rumble, rumble, rumble. All rumble, righty. Rumble, 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 rumble. Well, All that right. is what we're talking about here in this video. We're talking about the year 2020, and just kind of look back. Now, I know there's a lot of bad things, and a lot of people are anxious to switch the calendar. Just as a heads up, folks, January 1st, 2021, won't be remarkably different than December 31st, 2020. What? Nobody told me this. I've been waiting with bated breath. Figured but there, things are going to suddenly be different. There That's is right. hope. There is hope. Um, Mr. Boniger, maybe if you go out and come back in, you, you'll fix it. That's what happened with Tim. Exit the entire thing and come back? Yeah, yeah you never know. All right. All right, here we go. Make right, sure go you let ahead. me back in. Yeah, yeah, go there ahead. Go. Go ahead. elaborate ruse. Don't worry about it. Yeah, All right, folks, if you don't... Change, change nice your screen job. name, Tom. Change your screen name, quick! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't Man, trust Tom to let... Fast. 
He I came back on. He could not have come back any quicker. Do you notice that? He must have. Uh, this is, all right, folks. There. At this <laughs> point in time, what happens is the, whoever the last two, whenever someone new comes in, it fixes them, and then it cuts someone else. So now Roy's on the in and out thing. All right. Well, anyway, we don't have time to fix this weirdness. Finally right. correct. Good. What in the world? <laughs> what a great show, Tom. Great show. Thank you. Folks, if you don't know Tim, Tim runs Dice Tower West and also has his own channel where he has interviewed so many people over the year. That's why I thought he would have a lot of insight on this year. So the defining thing of the year 2020, very obviously, is COVID um, and just how that's affected everything. It was feeling pretty good in February. Um, <laughs> everything was pretty good. Dice Tower Cruise, Dice Tower West went off very well and were fantastic shows. And then the entire world shut down and is slightly reopened, but not tremendously so uh, right now. But COVID has definitely changed our hobby, for sure. Um, it's changed the the culture um, and how people we interact with each other. There are more people watching YouTube than ever before, but there are also more people making YouTube videos than ever before, or Zoom, or what have you. It's also affected board game publishers. Mr. Bonker, how would this have affected publishers? Well, um, early on in the in the entire thing, when everything shut down across uh, the country, all of the retail establishments did. Literally, the sales through that channel, we talk about channels of sales and retail hobby game store channel is one of the big ones. Uh, that literally went to zero. I mean, and when I say zero, I mean effectively zero. One month. We had a thousand dollars in sales, uh, you know, through the retail channel, which is crazy. Obviously, crazy. Um, but on the other side, the Amazon sales went through the roof, and that is a separate channel of sales. So the entire balancing of of the way sales occurred uh, was completely different. That was the biggest, most impactful portion of this, and I think we'll I'll stop there, and because there's other things I think that we're going to get on in a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it also affected people as players themselves. You know, all of us have had to change how we play games. You know, Z, what do you think about that? Well, I think the main thing is that it's, it's brought on the adaptation of two things. Folks having to learn or perhaps grow how much they were into solitaire gaming and start appreciating that as an aspect of the of the hobby certainly something that's been growing anyway but even more so this year and then a lot of folks that have to adapt their play sessions to include people they normally live with right so folks that would be in their bubble so to speak i i don't know i i wonder if that's done a lot to push um family weight games to the forefront and brought about games that now need to appeal to everyone in a household or anyone who would be interested in the household as opposed to allowing you and those friends of yours that enjoy those same kind of games to meet somewhere and play that because you, you simply can't or shouldn't, right? So I think it's, uh, I would assume behind the scenes it's been a good year for that kind of game, a good uh, family kind of year. Though there were definitely some, some wonderful heavier games this year. What about you, Roy? Yeah, I think it's definitely changed up a lot with uh, people playing a lot more often on things like Tabletop Simulator and things like that. I know it's not the preferred way to play games, but, I mean, people weren't really talking about these platforms at all before this stuff happened this year. And now there's so many people playing online and there's, like, dedicated groups and dedicated online events to playing these things virtually over Zoom and Tabletop Simulator. And um, that's one of the things, too, that the publishers have had to really embrace is being able to demo your game on Tabletop Simulator. Now almost all the new games people are putting out on these different digital platforms, just trying to find a way to show the audience, like what their game is and how it plays. The, uh, it also changed Kickstarter and Mm -hmm. well, I mean, actually, how did it change Kickstarter? Mike, you, you, you know, we've been doing a lot of stuff with Kickstarter. What do you think? How COVID changed Kickstarter? Yeah. Um, cause I don't know that it has tremendously. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that, that that is still to come. I do Well, I guess in certain ways it's changed. It's changed in the sense that it has delayed some of the projects. Obviously, there has been, a, you know, some delays that you can expect. But if anything, 
I think it's caused people to maybe understand a little bit more about what it takes for a project to go from inception to getting to your front door. I think people are more aware of kind of all of the potential delays. And I see Steven's already got his hand up. All of the potential delays within the that timeline of, of what it takes to bring a game from, you know, inception to, to your uh, house. And, you know, there's delays at the shipping areas. There's delays now through the... Um, you know, post office or FedEx or whatever the case may be. Stephen, did you have something you were? Yeah, he raised his mind. hand. No, I will. Yeah, yeah. If you don't mind, uh, I, yeah, I some at least some of the delays, um, and I might say more than just a little, uh, have incorrectly, inappropriately been blamed on COVID. In sure. my humble uh, opinion, meaning that. You know, it's very simp very easy when a project's delayed for a publisher to say, well, you know, COVID delays and this and that. China was not China was not shut down for that yeah. long. And only if you were really in that window did you really get any kind of impact. And then there was a, a, a small delay that, you know, a trickle delay. But they've got a lot of capacity out there. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't extent- I wouldn't. I wouldn't put 100% of that all on, on COVID. I think some people used it, use it as a good excuse. Sure, but these are some companies have kind of built up equity. Like, like for example, there are companies that sure. have consistently put out projects on time, mm-hmm. and now they're having a slight delay. And that, I think you can a lot, oftentimes point to, to yeah. COVID delays. So that's the main thing I've noticed, Tom, as far as uh, Kickstarter goes. I fixed it. I got everyone on screen. All right. Woo! All right. Well, one of the big things that I thought would happen this year um, that did not was, or what I, I guess one of the things I think that's happened this year is I think we're seeing a paradigm shift um, because people are not frequenting local game stores as much. They just can't. Now, the, a lot of local games, several game stores are doing well. People are coming in and buying stuff from them. But this affects the game stores. It affects the distributors, who this is their main outlay. And I've seen more and more publishers sell direct and or move to other online selling options. Some There's more and more Kickstarters each year that now that's the only way to get the game is through the Kickstarter or after. And that's changing things up quite a bit. I mean, Tim, you have a, a game cafe and you get games from different places. You actually have to keep an eye on Kickstarters now, right? No, absolutely. But the biggest thing that how it affected me is because, you know, I have three revenue streams. Uh, you know, I have the retail of the games, the food and beverage, and then the entertainment part. Uh, which is, you know, people paying to come in and play and get together. And I've just really realized how um, social animals we are. And there are so many people who, like, live alone or who work a lot, and they looked for that once a week to come play D&D or to go play where we really just get together. And that's why even across the country there's that big talk of bars and restaurants, and you think, man, can't people just not have a beer tonight or can't they? But – People need these outlets to get together because a lot of them just don't really have that in their life. And that's one of the biggest things, how it's impacted me in the community, is people just haven't had that opportunity to get together. All right, well, Tim, since we're on you, let's just talk about how this has affected conventions. Because I believe we now have gone, there will be no convention that has not been affected by this. Yes, uh, well, it, the biggest thing, we had to wait a long time because uh, the only way we were sort of able to get out of our uh, convention is the force majeure clause in our contract. And it's one of those kind of things where the hotel was waiting on forever because they don't really know because as of this point, nothing says that come March 3rd, we cannot have a convention. So there was really no legal reason that, or even moral reason they were obligated to let us out of the contract. Right. But it came to a point where they finally did say, OK, yes, because I, I just kept writing them emails and saying, hey, this is adversely affecting our business. We, we can't sell tickets. We can't tell people anything. We don't know anything. Can you please like let that clause enact? And they finally did. That, uh, that clause is uh, in every major contract ever written. Uh, and everybody now has heard of force majeure. Even I that's true. We didn't. Yeah. It's such a weird. I mean, I can literally look at a stack of contracts here. All the big ones. Sometimes you, you write contracts that one or <clears throat> one one and a half, two pages kind of thing, and you and you leave something out, which you shouldn't. 
but on any big contract, it's in bold and it's at the bottom of the like clause 37 in the contract. And now everybody knows that means if there's an act of God or a pandemic, you can not you can get out of this uh, out of this contract. It's a it's funny that that came into play and everybody knows about it this year. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few there's a few things that have been like that because of COVID. Like for mm. example, I think everyone now knows what an N95 is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Tire it's like, vernac- what? Who? You know, who would have known that? I mean, right. so. Yeah. But we've uh, we've not you know for us as both reviewers and we go to conventions and we run conventions. Every Dice Tower convention is now been closed for a year. Or will be when Dice Tower West. And it just, it changed how we do things. We, of course, pivoted and went to do things more online. But I don't know about y'all, but I'm I'm feeling the missing of connecting with people in person. Mm-hmm. What about you, Roy? Definitely. I mean, that's one of my favorite parts about this, this whole job in general is being able to connect with the people that also enjoy board games. There's so many people out there that watch our content that are super friendly and these Dice Tower conventions were like a way to get to interact with those people and and have fun and see people face to face. And it's a really big deal for the industry because, I mean, this is a social hobby that we like to play stuff together. I feel like you're really going to see that a lot when it comes to our best of the year because we played more games in a, in a small like group right. um, instead of playing them with all sorts of different people at conventions. So it's going to affect a lot of different things in the industry overall. Now, to that end, technology has had a boom I never even heard of Zoom before the year 2020. <laughs> I only ever used Skype. And as you can see, I'm very good at it. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. But both Zoom. Now, I, I am surprised that the, I don't know, I haven't talked to the people at Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator. I'm surprised that those aren't as big. Like, I thought they would just be overwhelmingly huge right now. But I think mm. people like that human interaction so much. But what do you all think about the, the, the technology, the Zooming and the stuff. Bonagar, you do that. You run a, a, a happy hour where you get drunk together each week. <laughs> no, that is not what happens twice a week. It's called Happy Hour with the Podfather, Tom. And you have been on the show. Yeah, but I can't uh, go yeah, on a show where the name week. is a lie. Oh, wow. And we, and, and we get together. It's very happy. <laughs> and I am the podcast. Anyway, so we, we, we get together, and literally it's about what, uh, what, what we've just been talking about, that we as human beings crave a social interaction, at least of some kind, even the most introverted person. And, I, and I'm the exact opposite. I, consider, I always say I'm a raging extrovert. I just want to be <laughs> around people. I want to do things with people. I want to go out. I want to see people I don't know, like, you know, at, at, at hanging out at a bar and just chilling out. Well, We've had to embrace, I mean, Zoom has been absolutely amazing for this this exact reason, that we can get together in a social sort of environment just to maintain contact. And yeah, and I've started it in the early part of COVID, and I've done it twice a week the entire time, and I said to everybody who shows up, I'm going to continue doing this until we sort of get back to some sense of normalcy and you'll be surprised how many people that do show up literally live alone see nobody maybe they go out and do some grocery shopping maybe but that's it so hopefully this has helped people and in general our technology zoom i think in particular has really helped people to make that little bit of connection that we all need so let's jump away from COVID for a bit. I mean, that is the main thing that happened this year. Let's talk about some gaming trends. We always say, you know, people are like, what are the gaming trends? One of the trends that I have noticed is, and this is a direct result of Kickstarter, although not limited to Kickstarter anymore, mm-hmm. is the releasing of the mega game. Like, as in, not just a mega game with, you know, a thousand campaign, but as in a humongous box, chock full, the deluxe, deluxe, deluxe edition. These are coming out on a fairly consistent basis. If you, you know, I don't know, five years ago we had the micro game. That is not what's going on right now. There are some <laughs> micro games being released, but we have, you know, Cleopatra Society of Architects and uh, Dwellings of El- Eldervale and just game after game. I remember, Bonacore, you're very proud of your War of the Ring. Tim has it behind him. That game looks like a normal Kickstarter release right now. So yeah. what do you all think about that? Z, this is like your favorite thing, right? The gigantic games. 
Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to happy news like COVID. Right. No, I agree. It's uh, it's this idea of how much can we offer? How much can we entice people to back this project? And it, I, I would say it's it's a perhaps not in a completely exclusive Kickstarter issue, but it's definitely where it seems to live. And uh, just so much that they add on to this, and eventually the, the the problem psychologically with this is you feel like you are getting a lot of, of bang for your buck when they unlock stretch goals, when you are getting more and more things, when there is a whole other expansion box to a game you haven't even played. But it also creates then this this sort of need to consume and own all the stuff that you're likely not going to get to because guess what? As soon as that game shows up at your house, there's another Kickstarter or two or seven that require your <laughs> attention. So it becomes about this sort of, you know, the, the backing of the game more than the owning and the playing like, of the games. It also makes me worry about the, um, the play testing of something like, like that. You know, when a game is supposed to be 120 hours of content, how many times have they play, te play tested that 120 hours of content? Once, maybe. So, I think it's a it's a strange phenomenon and one that I don't particularly subscribe to. And um, I also, though, think it's one that's here to stay. Um, another thing that happened this year, which I think is interesting i don't i like it but i don't know anyway it's the, the reprint we have so many reprints and reworkings and redones and sequels then i i don't know mm -hmm. that i've ever seen a, a like the year at this point in time we're seeing games that i would consider to be fairly mediocre games that did not get a huge audience and people are reprinting them um there's yeah. just it's so easy to find a game out there now um this is I talked about this Vassal's Law was if a game is great it will be reprinted. I might revise it to be like if it's a game, it will be reprinted at some point. <laughs> if the game is mediocre, it will be reprinted. <laughs> what do you think about that, Tim? Are you playing all these reprints? Actually I am. Like for example, like we were just talking about sort of a piggybacks off the last conversation. I just received Rococo Deluxe, um, which is reprinted, even though that's a great game. But then again, there are a lot of games, for example, which I'm real excited about. I heard it's just a rumor and maybe Tom you can confirm it. But games that were out of print, you know, were getting really high up on the list that people couldn't get. For example, I've heard the rumor of a Russian Railroads bundle being reprinted. Um, I think so I heard that too. Yeah, I mean, yes, because I do like that. But, but, but again, to me, that's a great game. That's not just an average game. But I think it just goes hand in hand with the growth of our hobby, right? Because, you know, two or three years from now, there's going to be people in the hobby who didn't know the games that you were calling mediocre or just average games. So companies now, and Stephen can probably talk about this, now have a way to capitalize again off that mediocre product for a whole new audience. Do you think, do you think Tom, and refresh my memory, like on some of the stuff that's come out recently that's been reprinted or redone, are, are smaller companies doing it? Like I don't, know that like ah, it seems the, like the everybody's doing are. it i mean is, is that i mean like fantasy flight was like right for a while was a king of it i mean so who is what are some of the bigger you know what what are some of the lesser known games that are getting reprinted i think it's smaller companies in which case that is a way of sort of just getting yourself known like oh you know i, I remember that game i do want that game let me go look at that game i know some sure, but there's also their name but, like that but a game being reprinted in the flood of games that's coming out isn't going to suddenly light the world on fire. Like, for example, Z, what's the game that was the reprint of Web of Power? Oh, uh, Iwari. Iwari. Right, so Web of Power, when I, I was looking this up, Web of Power really made a splash when it came out. It was one of the most talked about games, very big game. Iwari's get, got a little bit of buzz in a year of a ton of other games. It's not like... Suddenly people are going, oh, wow, I missed this amazing game. They're like, oh, here's another new game. Okay, I played it. Moving on. But, again, the problem with that one is it wasn't necessarily that big. It was just sort of a normal reprint. And so to sort of double back on what I was saying earlier, the way to grab this attention then is just to sort of outweigh everybody else. 
to show and be like, this game weighs 32 kilos. We're a reprint of Love Letter, but everything is made from actual bricks or whatever, right? So <laughs> that is something that does get that does mention, does get headlines. And I agree with uh, Steven that a good path to getting your foot in the door is going back in time, finding some game that was fairly acclaimed, reprinting a bombastic edition of it on Kickstarter, and now you're in the door. It's a good way to do it. It seems to be effective. Yeah, I, don't know. I think buddies this there. all comes down to a, a perception of value, and I think there's one thing that you mm -hmm. can say about Kickstarter for sure, is it has absolutely changed the perception of value in the board gaming hobby. Now there's this idea that, you know, $100 is maybe, it's expensive, right? But it's not out of the realm, and you're going to get a lot. You're going to be getting box upon box or, you know, module upon module. You're going to get a lot of stuff, but the perception of value has fundamentally changed, I think. Stephen and, and Tim, you, I'm sure you'd have, you know, some thoughts on this as well, but I think people are willing to pay more, but they're also expecting a particular thing, whether it's a bigger box whether it's, you know, I, I just, I really feel like that has changed fundamentally as, as a result of Kickstarter. And, I mean, look what Fantasy Flight just announced with their new Descent game. Uh, we talked about mm -hmm. this on Board Game Breakfast. I think that was a much bigger announcement that, than anybody's realizing yet. They, I Descent, agree because I Legends disagree with you dark. on that. <laughs> Descent Legends in the Dark, the new Descent is a $175 MSRP. That's amazing. How many store owners, Tim, will be having $175 games on their shelf? For Descent, they won't maybe be. They They're will. just moving into the Kickstarter audience. Yeah. That's what it well, is. Sure, sure. So so it just plays back into what Z is saying. Where, where but is the Kickstarter audience thing. everybody now? Is that, that's the thing. It's like, is that the mainstream board gamer now? Is the mainstream board gamer now somebody who's willing to spend $100, $150, $175 on a board game. That's you, that's what I'm not sure yet. If you're going to go through that much trouble to produce the game, this is I, this I believe this is what Fantasy Flight is doing, Asmodee is doing. If you're going to go through this much trouble to produce the game, blow it out, and we'll make much more money per unit anyway hmm. on this $175 MSRP game than we than they would on a $70 game. Well, would be we'll know in two years. We will. We will. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm. Excited to see, or I want, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what the final uh, thing comes about a, a, a mainstream company hitting a price point that big. Yeah, All know. right, we don't got a lot of time left, so let's jump onto something real quick that I think is pretty important from 2020. And we'll jump to Mike since he's the king of this, and that is the oh. solo game. Um, yeah. More and more people are playing games solo, and at this point in time, it is rare for me to see a big game release that does not have a solo variant in it. Um, Mike, are you happy? You're no longer alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah. Technically, well, he's still alone. Technically, you have to be, I guess, <laughs> to play this. So, uh, this is not an "I told you so" moment at all. But I, what I am happy about, no, it really is not. <laughs> what I am happy about is that through, uh, you know, the, this COVID situation and the people, like Z said, looking maybe to explore this, I am glad that there are so many viable options out there for people that now when they are exploring solo gaming, not only do they have a huge panoply of options in front of them, they're generally going to be much better options than they were five years ago. And this has been something that has been moving forward steadily. This is not new. It has been a huge growth market, I'm sure, in board gaming because if it weren't, if it wasn't making money, it would not still be there. So yeah. I'm just happy there are more options for people. I do think it's very important <clears throat> that we don't try to shoehorn in substandard solo variants just to please people, because that's going to do more harm than good. That's going to be counterproductive. Don't make it a stretch goal. Don't make it something that's added at the last moment. If it warrants one, have it there from the beginning. Make it part of the design process from the beginning. I will agree with you that I think uh, five years ago, maybe even three years ago, a solitaire mode for a game still seemed like a novelty. It is just yeah. not something. It's just not that strange anymore. It does not feel like a novelty at all anymore. It was a yeah. huge trend before this, and if you don't have it now, <laughs> you're coming out for with sure. a game. You did, you're doing something wrong. 
All right, so let's go through each of us real quick as we come to the end here. Um, and I know that, again, we talked about COVID at the beginning, but overall, I was really, lots of good things happened. I think sometimes good things get covered up, but let's just talk real briefly about our thoughts on 2020 as a whole. We'll start with Roy. Um, so for me as a whole, it's definitely been an extremely interesting year. Um, and it's a lot of the industry pivoting on things and trying to figure out how to make things work. A lot of it's just trial and error. And I know that some, some companies and people working at companies have fallen away along the way, but hopefully overall we can, we can come together and make things happen and, um, work hard to just spread how, how awesome board games are at bringing people together. So I think there's a lot of good things that can still happen for all of this. And it gives us an opportunity with all these digital platforms to talk to people all around the world, which is kind of awesome that normally you'd just be talking and playing games with just your game group. Now, if you're playing online or on Zoom or Skype, you can talk to people from anywhere, which is really cool. What about you, Mike? Yeah, I think that 2020 overall has been a very strong year for board gaming. I know that maybe mm -hmm. it's hard to see that through the prism of the difficulties that we've all faced in 2020, but I'm very hopeful for the future <clears throat> of board gaming because I really think that games are getting better and better and better. I also am uh, very optimistic that the connections that have been made, again, maybe through a little bit of kind of having to pivot, like Roy mentioned, things like the daily chats, things like the, the happy hours, you know, all the ways that we've found to make connections. I'm hopeful that those carry forward and we're able to keep these connections when we're hopefully able to meet again in person. What about you, Z? Yeah, these guys are hitting the nail on the head. It's uh, it's been a year of, uh, of obviously social adaptation and improvisation. I think, therefore, I, it's been also a year where that hasn't happened as much in board gaming. I think it's been a, a fairly safe year when it comes to board gaming, a year of refinement rather than innovation, which makes mm. sense. Everybody's innovating in the, in their lives, so the board gaming has felt a little bit safe. Having said that. It's been a strong year for gaming. It's been a strong year for IP-based games. It's been a strong year for heavy games. And uh, I'm glad to see that the the quality of the games did not dip because of the events in the world, you know. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm excited to see where we go from here. Next year is going to be a very interesting time. What about you, Steve? Anything major happen with you this year? <laughs> <laughs> the entire industry weeping uncontrollably over mm. one man retiring. The president of Hasbro, of course, I'm talking about, <laughs> not, not myself. No, uh, Notice he didn't uh, mention the word sadness. Mm. Weeping uncontrollably. It was, um, yeah, belly gut uh, laughter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, big year for me uh, to, uh, to retire, but I get to do more with you, Tom. <sighs> That's great. Um, but if I may... Uh, add something into the rest of the conversation. Uh, the fact that this is hopefully this doesn't go down, you know, known as the year of COVID, of course, but really known uh, as the year of the rise of the digital platform. Everyone has touched on this. We got we're going to have digital conventions. These are going to be going on forever. I think it's not going to just end. It's always going to be a piece of of major conventions. We'll have, we'll have to have a debate on that later because I highly disagree with you. We'll have it ha will have a component, not necessarily a huge component, but a, a component. Those platforms will get better. And the entire being able to reach out now to, to friends and do some gaming. I now have, you know, two game nights um, a week with people online, which is great. A, a role-playing game, I'm playing Pathfinder, and a you know, a, a digital game night as well. So these things have been great. And I think that this is going to be sort of part of our lives for forever now. All right, Tim, what about you? I, the, the one thing that I really, really uh, am, am happy for with this past year is I think it's brought the gaming community in particular really closer together because of all the Zoom and the stuff. For example, Tom, you know, you running the werewolves, you know, now you've got 12, 15 people who may have never known each other, see each other, so now when you go to a big convention, you know, like even like Gen Con or, or Essen or like the smaller ones like Dice Tower West or East or whatever, you're going to be able to know, like really know and have conversations and inter interactions with so many more people that didn't happen just a year ago, right? Because you walk into these conventions, you're like, I don't know that person, I don't know that person, you know, you don't have a lot of friends, but now all of a sudden 
you're going to go to a convention, you're going to have a whole bunch of friends, people to play <laughs> games with. So I think it's really brought us closer together in the gaming community in that aspect. All righty, folks. Uh, we're going to be ending this up here. I'm going to do my thoughts a little bit about 2020. That's coming up later today. I'm talking about my 10 favorite gaming experiences from 2020. But I know that this has been a tough year for many people, and it's been a little tough on many of us. But there's also many good things that came. And we want this Winter Spectacular to be a bit of a celebration for that. So in just a minute, we're going to have some contributors talk. We're ending out Board Game Breakfast at 1030. Violet and Ruby will be joining me to give their top 10s. Z will be jumping in with Castles of Tuscany later on around 1145. Then Brian will be joining us for several games. Z will be back later on with Unmatchers. A lot of stuff going on today. So we hope that you stick around and join us for that. I want to thank you guys for coming on and talking about this. There's, we'll never run out of things to talk about for sure, not with these guys. But uh, we got to keep moving here. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. I'm Mike Delicio. I'm Tim Mativier. And I'm the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacore. And, and I'm Roy Canada. too. Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I like how Bonacore was so very much yeah. ending it there. All righty, folks. <laughs> Let's let's jump to our contributors and we'll keep moving. What is up? My name is Melissa McCack and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week, I want to talk about Red Steel 2, the Wii video game, which sort of meshes Western and Eastern genres together. And you, so you could be shooting a revolver or maybe hacking and slashing with a katana. And it has this like arcade flair to the whole thing, which is super cool. I want to connect that to Flick em Up. So Flick 'em Up is totally Western. It kind of uh, does not have that Eastern flair to it, but it has that dexterity thing that you're doing kind of like with the Wii, right? The Wii, you, you have those controllers and you're, you know, shooting around or slashing and whatever. So Flick 'em Up has that dexterity where you're flicking this um, disc and you are a team of cowboys, I guess, and cowgirls, and you are doing different kinds of scenarios in the game where you may be trying or to like totally eliminate the other side or you're trying to uh, poison different buckets or trying to maybe clean the different buckets depending on which side you are. Anyway, I think that this game is a lot of fun. It has a lot of laughs. It's super cool. And that is really it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like, you could check out my and my brother's channel called Room 51. I'll catch you next time. A micro game is one that just doesn't have a ton of components, very light rule set, can be taught very easily. Um, I think the genre kind of started with Love Letter. This is Marvel Love Letter, um, but it comes in a bag and only has, you know, 20 some cards, very little uh, on co in components. Um, I recently played some postcard games that were on Kickstarter. They were literally on a postcard. This could probably con be considered a micro game, um, but traditionally a micro game could, is probably a card game. So button shy games are infamous for their wallet line of games. They come in a wallet here, but they are micro games. They usually have 18 cards in them, play very quickly. The rules are usually on a card or the front and back of a card. Very quick, easy to get into, but ultimately very small, very portable. That's a micro game. That's it. Uh, can we play now? Yes. Hi guys, and we're back still. Yeah. Two weeks in a row. Can you believe it? We're Randy and Ellen in case you forgot who we are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're continuing our series of games that essentially got us in the hobby. Basically the progression of games that we bought from the first till, well, till we feel like stopping. That's right. Which is <laughs> never going to end. First one we're talking about is King of New York, purchased on 9-7-2015. Yeah, and is the King of Tokyo's first, right? And yeah. then King of New York, okay. Um, I do not like this game. I've never liked yeah. it. No, nope. It fell a little bit flat, I guess. It, it was a, it's a more involved King of New, uh, King of um, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I actually prefer this one for sure. I just don't like any of them. Yeah, yeah. Enjoyed it, but he liked the original a lot better. So it just kind of fell. 
new characters. So if anything, you got new characters. I mean, that you people can play. genuinely love this. You just chuck dice and you like do damage to other people, yeah. and you have like life, and you yeah. You're basically it's like a king it's of the fine. hill kind of a situation, yeah. but with King of New York, you're also trying to control districts, and you can there's like army tanks and stuff involved. I think it's the better of the two. But it's a little less accessible. Yeah. So then the next game that we bought, which I love this one. This is so dumb. This the other great. one I didn't like, but this one I do. What the <laughs> heck? It's Loop and Chewy. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just, come on. We got it for our kids, and I play it all the time. So this is a Star Wars version. There's Loop and Louie, <laughs> which is like the four-player version. Sure. This is actually only three players, which is a little disappointing. So what did I do? What you always do. I bought baby. a second copy of it, and I <laughs> melded them all together, so it's now a six-player loop and chewy. And it's faster. And I put a 9-volt battery on it <laughs> with some weights. My gosh. You <laughs> so it, it literally flies. Cars. It literally can go like this fast. And you and so it's really, you just have these little, well, they're stormtroopers in this one. And if it comes past your little flapper, you're trying to hit the little guy as he's coming up so it doesn't hit your They're little disc. discs, yeah. If so it when bumps it, the discs... It, That's like a point you lose. Yeah, and, and to you have like three four. lives. Oh, three, yeah, three oh, lives. Okay. Yeah. So whoever's last man standing, kind of a thing. It's just so you're silliness, sitting there going, but it's so fun. And you're trying to hit it so that it'll like flip over and automatically hit somebody else's, so they have no chance of stopping it. But you can get strategic. Actually, there's little things that come out at the end yeah. of the rod, and you can make them like come this way. Yeah, you can like, make horizontal it like, easier. Or vertical. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's so stupid, but I love it. It's really, it's a really neat game. I um, will not play King of Tokyo, but I'll play Loop and Chewy yeah, all day. Maybe. And six players even cooler. <laughs> Anyway, thanks again, guys, for joining us, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. You know what I like about this game? I said you could take it on a trip. You can take them all on a trip, but let's just stick with green monsters or little things from outer space. I even forgot what it's called, but I'm telling you, it's great. And it's a war game, but nobody knows it. <laughs> but what do you have to act so stupid for? Hey, you're making those stupid sounds. God, you stupid. What stupid sounds? Partying in the stupid sounds. <laughs> Okay, so backstory here. So there's aliens, right? And they all discover time travel at the same time. So it's an amalgamation of all kinds of races. And they board a ship called the, the Znutar. And they have to eat, right? So they eat something called Zgwartz. And it's funny, eh? Without knowing it, you're gonna learn line of sight, movement, how to attack, what weapons to use. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. These are the characters you can play. You can play the Sarge with a movement factor of three, or the Machinist with a constitution of 14, or the Medic with an attack die of one. That's not gonna get you too far, but the mascot with three eyes, he can see, and Zugi Zangi the robot, with a constitution of 44, but he can't move too far! This is a game designed by Tom Wham, published by Steve Jackson Game, and it's a two-player game, and it easily soloed! In a two-player game, you can take the opposite side, play as an egg, and then the egg turns into a fragment. Check out the fragment. And then the fragment turns into a baby! Oh, a cute baby! And then something that looks like Nebby's mom. An adult. And the sequence of play is super easy for the monsters. Well, you grow, move, attack, and wake up. And for the crew players, you grab weapons, move, attack, and wake up. This is a close-up of a fan-made map. So we start by the right, and that's the back of the ship. And as you can see, this is like a hallway with other hallways and doors that cut off your line of sight, and another corridor, and other laboratories, and stuff, and stuff, and wicked! And we attack with what? Our hands? Actually, yes, but you can attack with a stun pistol. The wield, the welding torch, I should say. And bottle of acid, that's bad, that's bad. And a canister of squirts, yeah, you gotta waste squirts. And a can of rocket fuel to blow everybody up. War games come in different flavors, as is awful green things from outer space, sci-fi, action, war. Check it out. Well, hello, everybody. I'm David. You may know me from a little DIY segment I do on Board Game Breakfast sometimes.
Now today I wanted to do something a little special for the Winter Spectacular, and I wanted to keep the same theme that I have with my other segments, where we do a silly little project with simple tools and common materials. But I also wanted to do something a little more specific to the Dice Tower family. So in today's project we're going to make a cardboard dice tower modeled directly after the one you see at the start of every one of Tom's review videos. Now getting to the design I'm going to show you today actually took a lot more work than I expected. It all started with inspiration when I did this little craft project with my three-year-old daughter. It has a spiral staircase inside, but uh, needs some work. Then I did a very crude model to start thinking about the proportions and some of the mechanisms. Then I built the whole thing in 3D on the computer to get this model, which matches the proportions a lot more closely. Then I gave up on the idea altogether and decided to make this talking dice person puppet instead. But Tom wasn't sure how many people would actually want to make one of these. So back to the cardboard dice tower. Then a much more refined model where I'm really worked out the way that the different pieces will attach together. And finally, the design that we're going to make today, with artwork applied and most of the features incorporated. It has a removable tray, and if you turn it upside down, you can rotate the bottom, and there's a separate little storage space for your dice. It's also designed to be a pretty good scale for use as miniature terrain. Now I know, a lot of you actually don't like using dice towers, but maybe you know someone who does, and this could make a nice present for them. Anyway, enough talk, let's get into it. Now I'm not going to make this project in real time because that would take too long, but if you go to the link shown you can download the template, come back to this video later, and follow along to make your own. You could also use this as a chance to go have a snack, check your Facebook, have a nap, pretty much anything else than watch this boring video. For this project you will need two panels of 3mm thick corrugated cardboard, a standard Amazon box thickness, four sheets of half millimeter thick chipboard, just like you'd find in a cereal box, some way to print out the templates on plain paper, a sharp knife and a pair of scissors as well, a scoring tool, I use a knitting needle but an empty pen or a butter knife works too, a ruler, a glue stick or spray glue, and a hot glue gun for assembly. First print out all the templates on plain paper. If you don't want to use color ink the stone pattern looks fine in black and white as well. Glue the templates onto the type of cardboard indicated. If you have spray glue, use that, but a glue stick can work fine too, just be sure to get really good coverage. Be sure to align the corrugation lines in the thick cardboard with what is shown on the template. It's important that you glue the main wall template onto the printed side of the cereal box cardboard, so that the printing is not visible on the inside of your final tower. Let's start with the interior wall. Cut it out first. Then apply a bead of glue along the edge shown, and quickly run your scoring tool along the edge to chamfer it. Now score all the dotted lines on the spiral stairs. Then cut out the piece along the solid lines. Pre-bend all the creases to make the steps. Starting at the bottom of the stairs, you're going to glue each tab to the interior wall piece. For each steps tab, make sure you force the top of the step to be aligned with the markings on the wall. When you get to the top,
Next, cut out the stair support piece. Use an old pen to create grooves in the back face along every corrugation trough. This allows the cardboard to bend smoothly. Also cut out the base piece, including the semicircle shape in the middle of it. Glue the stair support piece in place, being sure to align each tick mark to one of the ones on the base. Glue the vertical interior wall in place first. Then glue it to the adjacent wall of the stair support. Now work your way around the stairs, adding a bead of glue for each tread. The stair support should always be aligned to the outer edge of the stair tread. You can now glue the last stair tread in place. Now at this point you might be thinking, uh, this is taking so long. Maybe I'll just go watch Netflix instead, but don't do that. Let's keep going. Okay, now score the dotted lines on the big wall piece and then cut it out along the solid lines, including the door and window openings. Carefully curl the piece so it will bend more easily. If it's starting to show a sharp bend, you can use a tiny bit of steam from the kettle to soften the fibers. Add a dab of glue at the front of the base and align the doorway in the center of the first step. Then work your way around the base, gluing the wall in place. Once it is glued all the way around the base, then glue the back seam all the way up to the top, forcing the overlap mark at the top to line up perfectly. Next, cut out the curved strip, straight strip, and lid base from the corrugated cardboard sheet. You'll also need the thin base ring from the other sheet. Create grooves in the back face of the curved strip, and then glue it around the bottom edge of the main tower, putting the seam at the back. Groove the back of the straight strip and then glue it around the edge of the lid base. Be sure to clean up any glue that gets on the inside. Place the main tower inside the lid. Drop the base ring over top. Now carefully work your way around the edge, gluing the ring to only the outside wall. Rotate the lid as you go to make sure the lid still spins. Use scissors to trim off the excess material of the ring. Score and cut out all the top battlement pieces. Prevent the inside tabs on the lower ring and slide over top of the tower. Once positioned, glue each tab in place. Fold down all the top tabs of the main tower, then glue the upper ring on top. 
align the middle block of the battlement's outer wall with the center of the tower and glue it in place. Pre-bend each of the support blocks and fold and glue them in place. Score and cut out all of the little T-shaped pieces. Fold and glue them to make little blocks. Glue each one in place to form the merlons around the top of the battlements. Now at this point you may be thinking, is this segment still going? And the answer is yes, it is still going. But we just have one part left to make and then we can get back to what you really want to be watching. Okay, score and cut out the main courtyard piece. Also cut out the flagstone pattern piece and glue it onto the back of the main cardboard piece. Cut out the last piece from the three millimeter cardboard and glue it in place on the hatched area. Pre-bend all the score lines for the walls, then fold each side inwards and glue in place. Once the sides are done, apply some glue along the end and tuck in the end flap. And finally, we're done. Now you can store your dice inside, close it up, and then align the little triangle in the front with the front of the courtyard, and you're all ready to use it. I hope you enjoyed today's project, and have fun watching the rest of the Winter Spectacular. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.